This is the Story Punks podcast, the show where we talk about all the punks. So steampunk, diesel punk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. I'm your host, Cindy Grigg. This is episode 47, the first of two parts. And today we're talking about ecopunk and solar punk. I'm so excited to have Serena Ulubari on the show with me. She's an editor, she's a writer, and I'm so thrilled to speak with her about this because she works with World Weaver Press, which has produced anthologies relating to solar punk and so much more. So I hope you're excited to dive deeper into this really fun, really innovative punk that honestly I get a lot of questions about when I'm out and about. A lot of people are curious about it and it's one of those more fringe punks that a lot of people are interested in. So uh, yes, very much looking forward to sharing this with you. And again, it is in two parts. In the first part, we'll be talking about definitions and also about some of the different themes that come up in solar punk and some that may surprise you because sometimes we think Eco fiction is all one type of mood and stuff like that, but Serena has some really cool insights. Can't wait to share that with you. And then in part two, we'll actually be talking about her recommended reads. I had a really great listener question uh, about reads and solar punk, and that's something that I just ate up. I loved hearing her recommendations and so much more. So definitely stick around for episode 48 as well. And on that note, if you are ever interested in leaving your comments or your questions for an upcoming guest, the way you do that is through the newsletter. And I'll just quickly point you to that because I've mentioned it in so many episodes leading up to this one. But you just go to storypunks.world forward slash newsletter to join that group. And that's how you hear the announcement when it's it's usually far in advance of when it actually airs. And so that's why it would be great to be in that email group where you'll get the notice and you can respond back and say, yeah, I actually do have a question about that or whatever you want to do. So uh, to catch you up on what's been going on in my world, I've been looking for land, which is really surreal. I have never looked for anything permanent, uh, let alone land. It's just not something that's been on my radar. But the reason why I'm doing that is because, as I've mentioned in previous episodes, I'm interested in transitioning my life to possibly be, you know, out in the boonies, a little more off grid. And honestly, I want to build a tiny house and most areas are not zoned for that, which is a total crock. I mean, I, (laughs) I think it's really so I get it, though, like urban planning and, you know, traffic can become an issue, parking specifically can become an issue if residences are smaller and I I get all that. But it's also really disheartening to try to find a way to be connected to the people in your life living in a certain metro area. But you also don't want to shoulder a massive mortgage. You want to live small. You don't want you know, your house to be your priority. So as I've been, you know, battling that give and take, it's led me to looking to surrounding areas and looking for some land where the zoning is different and where I could just drive a little ways and be back in town with those I love and all that good stuff. So uh, yeah, that pretty much catches you up to what's been going on in my world. A fundamental and strategic realignment of my life <laughs> to help me get more fiction written. And you can find my fiction at cindygrigg.com, C I N D Y G R I G G.com. So, uh, the last thing that I'll point you to, I don't actually have a resource to point you to today, but I do hope that you'll participate in a mid-season survey that I've created, and that is so helpful for me to understand what you've been liking, what you could do without when it comes to the show. So I can still shape the show to fit in with what people are liking the most. So if you want to weigh in on certain types of episodes, you know, specifically, you know, do you like the book club episodes that we did or do you not? Um, How's it working as far as me sharing resources and all that good stuff? So yes, please weigh in. You do not have to give your info, but you're welcome to if you would like me to know who you are. And uh, you don't have to be a member of the newsletter or anything. It's just a public survey, actually. So uh, if you go to storypunks.world forward slash survey, that's where you can participate. And it's so valuable to me. So please take the time over the next 
two weeks to leave your feedback and help shape the show to what's most meaningful to you. So other than that, what do you say we nerd out over some solar punk and eco punk goodness? Here is part one of my discussion with Serena Ulabari. Serena Ulibarri is a fiction writer who lives in New Mexico. She attended the Clarion Workshop at UCSD in 2014 and earned an MFA in creative writing at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her fiction has appeared in various magazines and anthologies, including Lightspeed, Fantastic Stories of the Imagination, Weird Book, and Gigonotosaurus. She is Editor-in-Chief of World Weaver Press. So welcome onto the show, Serena. I'm so excited to talk with you about these environmental punk genres. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so on this show, we do talk about the punks. So let's get right to those definitions of any terms you resonate with. So it could be eco-punk, ho-punk, solar punk. What terms, or they could be adjacent to these. They don't have to have punk in the name, but what defines your work and what are your definitions around them? Sure. So I think uh, eco-punk and solar punk and climate fiction are all kind of uh, similar terms that overlap. Um, I think of uh, eco-punk as being, um, you know, any kind of like climate fiction with the environmental focus that has a sort of punk aspect. And uh, but uh, so when I think of eco-punk, I think of things like uh, the Monkey Wrench Gang. Um, which is like eco-terrorists trying to stop the building of a dam. Um, and um, which is a book that actually kind of infuriated me when I read it, but uh, <laughs> never, never mind about that. Um, Maybe later. <laughs> yeah, I might rant about that later. Um, but, uh, but it's a good example and one that people know and recognize. So that's how I kind of think of eco-punk uh, or a solar punk is uh, looking at uh, environmental issues through an optimistic lens. Uh, a lot of ecopunk is not a lot of people ecopunk and climate fiction is not uh, very positive. It's often uh, sort of disaster focused or uh, apocalypse focused. And uh, solar punk uh, looks at environmental issues from the optimistic angle. Um, solar punk also has a particular aesthetic uh, that the others don't really. So you know, uh, you know, green buildings and, uh, you know, skyscrapers covered in, uh, you know, vines and, um, you know, flowery dresses and things like that, um, you know, give it that sort of punk aesthetic, um, as well as the, um, the punk aspect of, of opposing the mainstream narrative, which is that we're all doomed. Uh, Solar Fang says, what if we're not doomed? What if we have to, you know, live through this and how can we make that a better world and not just, uh, not just take for granted that everything sucks. <laughs> yeah, totally. And do you run into a ton of, you know, how can we circumvent this apocalypse that supposedly has to happen? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the idea behind solar punk in that like, we're trying to take technologies that already exist and issues uh, that are already there and, sort of shine them up and make them look cool so that people want to pursue them uh, and, uh, and want, to, want to use them and make them part of their lifestyle. So solar punk is not just a genre of fiction. It's also this like grassroots movement of artists and activists and, um, and people who are really trying to sort of make this part of their lifestyle and uh, not just fiction. Absolutely. Okay. So what drew you to writing about this kind of stuff? You're an editor as well. So obviously you love words, but why can you think of maybe a specific situation as you grew up or anything like that, that just really pulled you in and brought you to this path that you're currently on? Yeah. So um, I've always been interested in uh, environmental issues and I grew up in uh, several like rural areas. Um, I, I lived in the mountains in Colorado and then we had like a little goat ranch in Wyoming for a few years. And then I lived in rural Oklahoma. And, um, so I was, you know, just growing up, I was always kind of aware of, of a lot of environmental issues, you know, water, uh, shortages and water rights. Um, 
and, um, you know, we would be, we'd like pick up trash when we went out for a hike and, you know, things like that. So it was just always kind of part of my life. And I was like that obnoxious kid that was like, you know, yelling at people for not recycling and stuff. So, you know, it's always kind of been part of my, uh, part of my personality, um, and, and something that I've been concerned with. Um, and, uh, you know, being in uh, rural Oklahoma, there's tons of oil derricks everywhere. And, you know, the oil and, and gas is very much part of their economy. And um, I remember as a kid always being kind of disturbed by those, uh, the big oil machine. I, I always thought they looked like big red-eyed monsters that had been chained to their place to serve, you know, and to labor and extract this stuff. So, um, so these issues have always been on my mind. But, um, before I started publishing fiction, I uh, was a fr- I was doing a bunch of freelance gigs, freelance writing gigs, and uh, one of them was writing a column on ethical consumption um, for an environmental website. And a lot of that was, you know, uh, this company will uh, have you know this percent of sustainable resourcing by this year, you know, and. Um, Actually, I, someday I'm going to go back and like check and see if any of these companies actually did any of that stuff. Oh, totally. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I, someday I'm going to do that. But um, you know, I, I so I was, and I, I learned a lot about sustainable technologies and the the efforts that you know were going on at the corporate level, um, and uh, as well as greenwashing and you know things they said they're doing when that they're not, and uh, and all of that. So so I was very interested in. Um, in that issue while I was working for that website. And I started writing sort of satirical environmental uh, fiction. And um, like I wrote, there was this, there was this controversy of, I don't know if you remember about like the CFC light bulbs or just the incandescent light bulbs, like they were going to outlaw incandescent light bulbs. And um, you know, that was a thing that was going on, um, you know, I don't know, 2010 or so. And, um, so I wrote this story that was like Fahrenheit 451, but rather than the, um, the, you know, firemen coming in to burn the books, it was the electricians coming in to destroy the light bulbs. And, um, I submitted it to my MFA workshop and like, nobody got it. Nobody knew what I was doing. Like nobody knew the issue that I was writing about and the satire didn't come through. Nobody knew me. So they kind of assumed I was this like conservative who was, uh, you know, criticizing the environmental movement. And like I was a crit- I was criticizing the environmental movement, but not for the reasons that they that they, they thought. thought. And um, so I got so it it just it didn't work. And like I got kind of scared away and like stopped writing about environmental stuff for a while. Um, but then when I went to the Clarion Workshop, which is this awesome six week fantasy and science, science fiction workshop uh, that they do every summer, I had a classmate um, who was from Singapore. And uh, he was talking about what Singapore looks like and, you know, how they have these like, you know, big sort of decorative solar collectors and you know, eco-friendly buildings that look like lotus leaves and uh, you know, these big high-tech biodomes. And I was just like, what are you talking about? And I started looking it up on my phone and like showed it. I was like, is this, you know, I saw some of the pictures of the biodome. And I was like, is this what you're talking about? He's like, yeah, that's my hood. We live in the future. And it I was just like, it never, it was like, like it never occurred to me that the future could look like that. You know, so, um, you know, that we didn't have to have an apocalyptic wasteland where all the trees are dead. Like it was just this mind blowing thing. Like the future could look like that. And I mean, Singapore has got its issues. So, you know, I'm not uh, confusing that with like an ecotopia or anything, but um it's, uh, that was the moment that I was like, that's the kind of future I want to write about. That's the kind of future I want to live in. So that was really the turning point for me. That is such a cool journey. Thank you for detailing it. So I believe I first heard of you, Serena, in conjunction with Ellie Blue's anthology, which is part of Microcosm Publishing. Anyone who's followed the show, it was episode two or three, I can't remember, but she was on the show talking about bicycling as a lifestyle and all kinds of things. And she also has innovated this genre called bicycling science fiction. And I just love that she's created this niche. But this anthology was called Biketopia. It's got this amazing cover. And the subtitle is Feminist Bicycle Science Fiction in Extreme Future. So your work has been featured in tons of anthologies. And anyone can go to your site and see it under your published works. But would you consider yourself mostly a short story writer and editor? 
Um, yeah, I mean, that's what I've, that's what I've accomplished so far. I've, uh, I don't know exactly how many short stories I've published, but it's, you know, 30 to 40, something like that. It's a lot. Um, and, and they're, you know, they're not all, they're not all pro level. Um, you know, a lot of them are, um, especially because I came out of an MFA program where, you know, they're like, oh, you get paid for your writing. That's, you know, you must be inferior. So, um, you know, so a lot of my early stuff was like, you know, these non payment mags and stuff. But, uh, yeah, I, I um, have written longer works, but none of those have been published yet. So, um, so I published a fair amount of short fiction. I love working with anthologies, like the Bytopia anthology was really cool. Um, and Ellie did a great job with that. And, um, and the other stories in it are fantastic. And, you know, they are, you know, it's the prompt was utopia or dystopia. And so, you know, dystopia is easier, right? It's easier to write about usually. So I had just sort of learned about, um, you know, solar punk, uh, when I, when I came across the term, it just like gave a label to this idea that I was already, that was already percolating for me. Um, so I really wanted to do a solar punk work for that, um, for that anthology. And, um, I was really happy to get in and she put me, you know, at the very beginning of it. So that's like, you know, the introduction to this whole, whole anthology is my story. Um, that's pretty awesome. Speaking of solar punk, of course, let's talk about your anthology, Glass Gardens Solar Punk Summers. So what was it like putting this together and what insight do you have for anyone who's putting anthologies together in general? Yeah, so I have it here. Um, yeah, I'm really proud of this anthology. And, um, you know, I started uh, putting this together at a time when a lot of people were talking about solar punk, but not a whole lot of people were writing it, or if they were, it wasn't getting published. So, um, you know, we had, we had Sun Vault, which is uh, great, but uh, a lot of the stories aren't very optimistic. You know, they're solar punk and eco speculation, right? So it's kind of a mix. And, um, and we'd had Wings of Renewal, which is a, um, an anthology that was a little bit more fantasy. It was dragon-focused solar punk. And there's some really good stories there. But I was like, I want to do optimistic science fiction. I want it to be, you know, both of, both of those things were important to me in, in selecting the stories. So, I mean, one thing to consider when you're um, putting together an anthology is that, yes, you want the stories that are the best best stories and best written, but you can't, you know, if you're putting together an anthology, you don't just pick, okay, these are the best stories and kind of throw them together. Then you have to think about what the anthology as a whole is doing. And, um, you know, for, for this volume, it was basically, I was trying to define solar punk and give like various examples, um, of what it could look like since it hadn't really been very well established yet. So, um, so reading through the submissions, I had to make choices like, you know, oh, this story's really good. It's really well written, but it doesn't quite fit what I want, you know, solar pump to be, um, or, you know, um, you know, this, this story's, you know, has all the solar punk aesthetic, but it's not really optimistic, you know? And so I had to make decisions about my vision of, of solar punk and what elements were essential to it. And, uh, and which ones can be bent or, or change. Um, working, putting together an anthology um, also has, has to do with how the stories talk to each other within, um, within the anthology. So arranging them, I tried to make these like links between each story. Um, you know, maybe that was a setting or maybe it was a theme or, um, you know, a type of character or something, but um, so that, so that the stories kind of, engage with each other as well. Like I had two stories that were set in Australia, so I kind of put them close together. And two stories that mention like Garden of Eden, so I kind of put them, you know, close together. And they're very different stories, but that similar element like, you know, helps kind of link them uh link them within within the anthology. So Wow, you speak about it almost like it's a sculpture, and I really like that. Well, and it is, um, because they, they say uh, when you're making a sculpture, you take away everything that isn't the, the sculpture, right? You start with right. the block, you take away everything that isn't, you know, uh, you know the Statue of David or whatever. And um, that's the same thing when you're doing an anthology, because you get all the slush. You know, people send you stuff, and you <laughs> so just have to, you have to, you know, call away everything that isn't the anthology. <laughs> 
Yeah, that is so cool. And I love your point about having different pieces talk to each other. As someone who's not writing an anthology, but just writing a body of work, to think about the different aspects of what I'm writing talking to each other in some way is really interesting. And I'm sure lots of artists can relate to that. So I've never thought of an anthology that way. Really, really cool. Okay, so I'm riffing here so we can cut this if it doesn't work, but... Solar punk summers. I'm just wondering about the summer element of it. How did that figure in? So, um, I mean, I wanted to do a solar punk anthology, but I wanted it to be a little bit more, uh, have a, have a, a slightly more specific angle. So, um, I thought about, um, just the, the season. So I'm actually putting together another one that's solar punk winters. And that was, that was part of the plan all along to have like, you know, these seasons and I'm probably not going to do the, you know, spring and fall, but, um, I at least wanted to, um, to, to have the summer and winter. So, um, with the summer aspect, uh, I thought it could inspire some of the, you know, the conflict, um, because, um, you know, climate change is often called global warming where, you know, things are going to be a lot hotter. And so, you know, uh, it takes a, you know, nice, you know, nice summer day. Well, what's it going to be when, you know, we have all this additional, all these additional greenhouse gases in the air that may not be so pleasant anymore. Um, so, so that was part of it, just making the uh, setting, kind of, you know, kind of an antagonist. And some of the stories do that and some of them don't. Um, but, uh, you know, and also, you know, when people think about summer, they think about sun, you know, and that's when people are, more aware of, uh, you know, oh yeah, we could get solar panels on our house and you know, <laughs> uh, things like that. So that's when people are thinking about um, the, these kinds of issues a little bit more. With the winters, I did the, the flip side. It's like, what do you do when you only have a few hours of sun per day? What do you do when your solar panels are covered in snow? Like, you know, what are the other other um, ways that uh, that we can live sustainably. And so with the winters one, I have uh, stories that are around like geothermal or hydroelectric or, uh, or wind. And, uh, and it, it forces writers, it forces the writers to kind of uh, think outside the box a little bit more and, uh, you know, learn about some of the alternatives um, that, that are there. So, because to me, uh, solar punk is not just solar. Like part of the reason we use that term is um, because the solar panel, it makes a good, um, you know, visual image, um, but solar, sun, bright, you know, the solar punk is the idea of a bright future. It doesn't have to be just, you know, photovoltaics. <laughs> and it's like that solar theme becomes a representation of, of what all the hopeful things you've just mentioned. I love that. Exactly. So when it comes to creating that conversation between winter and summer, that's really cool. I don't know that you'd call it a conflict, but a contrast maybe. Yeah. And um, it makes me think, so we've been talking about hope and, you know, the hopeful nature of solar punk and other genres that could go this way. So where do you find the tension for a story then? Mm -hmm. So, uh, what I always say is, uh, you know, I don't believe in utopia because people live there and people will always find conflict in something. We do. So, yeah. And, uh, and also, you know, it, it kind of amuses me when people say, you know, when people think about, oh, a world that runs on sustainable technology, obviously that's a utopia. It's like, well, look at Singapore, look at Brazil. Um, you know, these things do not necessarily go together. Uh, sustainable technology does not automatically go with social justice and things like that. I wish they did, but, uh, you know, in, in this world, not necessarily. So, um, so I think, uh, conflict can come from a lot of places. And I think if you're, if you're thinking about writing solar punk, you're interested in this aesthetic, those themes, um, but you're having trouble coming up with the conflict, look more closely at your character. And, um, you know, dig into your character a little bit um, and see what kind of small conflicts they have. Because a conflict doesn't have to be, uh, you know, world, you know, world at stake. Uh, it could be. And actually, with climate change, that's exactly what we're talking about, actually, is the, you know, the world at, uh, you know, our, our environment, our atmosphere, all that at stake. But solar punk stories often take place after 
that big change has already happened, you know, either the crash or, um, you know, or preventing the crash. And, you know, it's just people living in a world that looks different because of that. So, um, so it doesn't have to be this, these like really high stakes, you know, things. It can be personal conflicts. It can be, uh, you know, who, who in the character's life are they in conflict with? Um, what in their setting is uncomfortable for them? Uh, what do they want? Because uh, your character has to want something and, you know, what's, what's in their way. So one of, um, so I have a um, story in um, Dreamforge magazine, which is um, a solar punk story. And um, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay. Sorry, just listening. Just make sure my screen froze for a second. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, so yeah, I have a story called The Spiral Ranch in, uh, in Dreamforge magazine. And um, it's... Uh, there are lots of conflicts in this story. So I took the idea of the vertical farm, which is, you know, you're growing uh, crops in a, you know, uh, indoors under UV light and, um, uh, you know, often in a, like in a skyscraper. So I took the idea of a vertical farm. And so what if we do that with livestock? Um, so I have this like spiral pasture going up uh, inside a skyscraper where they have dwarf cows. And um, so then the, um, the cows start disappearing. So there's that's like the external conflict and then there's internal conflict too. And most good stories have both. So the external conflict is the cows start disappearing. And then it's like a mystery that character has to figure it out. There's, you know, just looking around is the, um, is the tracking app just not working? Did they get left in a, you know, lower level pasture? Um, did they stumble in the elevator and then end up down in the lobby? What, you know, or are they being abducted by aliens? Like what's happening? And so she, um, you know, camps out and like finally sees what's, uh, who's taking the cows and, uh, and then the antagonist, I won't say it in case someone wants to read the story because it's kind of a spoiler, but like the, the antagonist absolutely has, uh, their you know motivations. They they are doing the right thing from their point of view. So we have this sort of idealistic um, conflict, and then uh, the con and then but then there's like the more personal conflict too, and the more internal one, which is uh, that we have this like cowboy character who's you know dealing with the animals and you know hands in the dirt and uh, and all of that, and um, her best friend or her former best friend who you know they started this weird company together. And then now, uh, you know, the friend is like the CEO of the company and she's uh, never comes near the animals and is literally at the top of the skyscraper in her like glass office. And, um, uh, you know, and so they've, they've sort of separated. And so there's the, the friendship um, aspect and the, you know, uh, the, you know, dealing with the, the, the ground level and the, you know, the dirt versus the abstract. And so like, that's the, they illustrated it. And that's like the, the conflict that they illustrated with these, these two characters sort of, you know, on opposite sides of the page. So I love how that was done. That looks so good. Yeah. It was cool. Um, so anyway, I think, um, I think solar phone can have, you know, plenty of, plenty of conflict. Uh, another example I wanted to give from the Solar Punk Summers anthology was uh, from G.K. Mock's uh, The Spider and the Stars, which I think is one, really one of the best pieces of Solar Punk that's been written. It's a lovely, inspiring story. And um, it follows a character through her whole life. And it starts when she's a kid and her parents are trying to introduce insect protein as a sustainable food source. And so there's instant conflict there because, I don't want to eat bugs. Like, you know, it's, and so they're, they're trying to do it in this very solar pump way where it's not like, you know, you need to be eating crickets because, you know, we're going to all starve to death if you don't. They do it in this, like, we make this really delicious, you know, dessert for you made from cricket flour <laughs> and you know, try that. Um, so and Rina, then, can I ask if you yeah. eat insects? Uh, I never have, but I would, I would try it. <laughs> yeah. So, I've thought about it, but I never yeah. have. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, like then like it skips ahead and then the character is like a, a teenager, a young adult and um, has decided to go vegan, which means even, you know, including not eating insects. So that puts her in conflict with her parents who have like devoted their whole life to this. Um, and then like, you know, later on she, uh, but she's still working with the insects, but in like genetic engineering and just studying them, doing other things. So then she, um, you know, creates this really interesting science project and wants to uh, present it at a, at a fair. Um, it was like big science fair with it's a competition, and you know the winner gets a big grant and stuff like that. So you know, so there's more conflict there. There's the, the competition, and the, you know what what does she do if she doesn't win? What does she do if she does? So um, you know, there's there's conflict baked into you know each of those scenarios. Such good examples. It's a question I get when I've been at conferences and stuff. And it once you start talking about it, it's so obvious that there's so many different ways to have these tensions in these mm -hmm. stories. And I really like the ones you brought up. So thank you. All right, StoryPunks, let's actually break the episode here. I'm so excited again to share Serena's upcoming recommendations for solar punk and eco punk reads. If you are brand new to this and you're still wondering how to sink your teeth into it. Other than that, if you are interested in my editing services, that's something I mentioned in the previous episode. Yes, I do still have some of those complimentary editing sample sessions to schedule. Even if you aren't done with your manuscript yet, you can get on my schedule and that's where I take a look at the first few pages of your manuscript or your script or whatever you're working on. And I give you the full editing treatment and give you a report that actually shows you what you can work on, what you know struck me developmentally, and also on a line editing level. So all levels of editing applied to your sample, and then you can decide what level of editing makes the most sense for you, whether you go through my services or not. So it's a great way to get uh, you know some eyes on your manuscript, and hopefully I can help as many people as possible. My schedule is filling up. But the way that you get involved is you go to storypunks.world forward slash newsletter. And when you do that, it will actually prompt you with a return email. You know, it'll say, here are all the resources to catch you up and get you in the flow of the Storypunks community. And editing is one of them. So you'll just click on the link and that's how it gets started. So I hope many of you will take advantage of that. This would be a great time while you take a break between the first and second part of this interview with Serena Ulubari. And other than that, I'm just wishing you the best and hope that everything's going well in your world. 